And the Blue Jays continue to knock the ball out of the ballpark. Donaldson just reached out and poked that thing to the walk tonight. Bautista hits it high and deep to left. Gardner at the wall. Goodbye home run. Jose Bautista has given the Blue Jays the lead here in the 10th. His 25th. Is sports fell story time. We are going back. We are talking about the bat flip game. We have danced around it. We did the Kansas City Royals game. We did the David Price start. We talked about Brett Laurie. We talked about all kinds of stuff, but have not talked about the uh, seminal moment, the defining moment of the 2010s for the Toronto Blue Jays, the moment that sort of came to define the era that comes to define, I think, a lot of the fandom in uh, around this team in, in sort of the modern context. And in a lot of ways, I think, put the Blue Jays back in the consciousness of, of fans in, in this country and fans in this city and is the beginning of the team that we see today, this sort of young core with the exciting guys and and uh, that bridge to competitiveness again now, five years later. Um, this is really a rejuvenating time, and we're going to dig into, I know, again, we know we talked about the price trade, and then we talked about the game against Kansas City, but it only felt right to give the proper kudos, the proper due to the bat flick game itself. Yeah, I feel like we've sort of done every Blue Jays moment we could without directly talking about the bat flip, which I think is fair, especially like when, you know, we started doing these story times not too long before uh pandemic kicked off. Yep. And then when the pandemic kicked off and sports was canceled, it was like every Canadian network and publisher and all the things were doing look backs at the bat flip. Mm hmm. The statute of limitations on us not <laughs> doing the bat flip game, I think, uh, has passed. And now we're uh, ready to talk about it. And there's a lot of stuff that, you know, we didn't really get into, I think, in past episodes that I, I really did want to talk about. And again, we, we talked about Brett Laurie. We talked about last year, the, the 2014 team and, and them um, not loading up. And I think, you know, obviously now having this a bit of distance and, and sort of knowing where this all comes from a really exciting thing to sort of revisit and, you know, go over. And I think we start, you know, we, we, we touched on it last week as we were very brief in our, in our sort of what came of the 2014 season and how did that end? And then what did they do in the off season? And it really does start November 18th. They signed Russell Martin as a free agent and, Boy, I was excited about this one, Russell Martin, somebody that was one of my favorite players and then became even more that with Toronto. If you can remember before, you know, 10 days before the Donaldson deal, do you remember sort of where you stood on the 2014 signing of Russell Martin? Yeah, I think I'm going to do the rest of the 2014 acquisitions. The, let's call them pre-Donaldson sure. moves. I think I'm going to do them a bit of a disservice right now. And I don't really entirely mean what I'm saying. But to me, after the disappointment of 2013 and 14, signing Russell Martin felt like bringing an adult into the room. Right. And, and they talked about they talked about changing the culture was was the, was the beginning. That's of it. right. And it just felt like. Not And again, this is no disrespect to Mark Burley or R.A. Dickey. Always disrespect to Jose Reyes, but that's not what I'm really <laughs> saying. But like, it just felt like, and I know Mark Burley has basically accomplished everything you can accomplish on a baseball field as a professional player. But he was, you know, in the twilight of his career and bringing on Russ, both because of the position he plays, the recent experience he had, the fact, like, honestly, like I'm not a big you know, nationalist guy, but him being a Canadian 
when the team seemed like they were grasping for a like iconic Canadian player for the last maybe ever. It just felt like it all the cards lined up and it felt like bringing him in was a statement of intent, mm. I guess, because as we've talked about many times, and I'm sure we're about to talk about many, many more times in the 2021 off season, free agent signings don't really happen for the Blue Jays. Most acquisitions are made through trade. Uh, I'm not going to get into the positives and negatives of that. It's just a fact. Mm-hmm. And then signing Russ and him being who he was, it felt like, okay. And especially after the trade deadline or lack thereof in 2014, it felt like a, a, a statement of intent and it felt like a, not, a, not quite a mea culpa. It was the organization sort of being like, we know. Right. Yeah. I think that's a good point. And I think you, I think you hit it right on with the idea that they didn't attract free agents because they didn't, they didn't before this. And they, they basically don't shake that reputation until signing Ryu in the winter of 2019 or signing Springer even. I'm like, we were, we were very doubtful that they were going to sign Springer in 2021. Uh, it, it, it sort of, you know, Russell was the only guy that you were able to point to in almost ever. That was like, here's a free agent in a part of his career where he is useful and is in his late prime and can contribute and is signing for five years, $82 million. It was sort of the only example we had of them really opening up the bank and 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 like like you said sort of showing that they were willing to do what it took to make that big deal and he would be you know obviously the catcher defense is one of those nebulous things but you're never quite sure exactly how much to assign to it but he in his first year especially a 112 OPS plus and you know a really they had a young pitching staff other than Burley it was, you know, it was Stroman and it was they, they had Sanchez in the back end of that bullpen and they had some guys that they needed to bring along and they really needed to calm them down. I think of, you know, Marco Estrada has a breakout year that year. You know, R.A. Dickey had 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 some ups and downs in, in his short time. But, you know, you had 20 year old Alberto Asuna, 22 year old Aaron Sanchez. You had, you had Brett Cecil finding his way as a reliever. Liam Hendricks has an ERA under three. I think Russell was really important for this version of this team to, as you said, sort of be the adult in the room and be the guy who had, you know, he had brought playoff success to Pittsburgh. He had had playoff success in New York. He had had success making the playoffs in LA. Playoffs had sort of followed him around and he had sort of earned that reputation as a guy that maybe did some of the smaller things that don't show up. The old, the classic don't show up in the box score kind of stuff, but uh, it also <laughs> did show up in the box score as well over those three years, that the first one in Toronto and the last two in Pittsburgh. Yeah. And I think this was also like another notion that wouldn't go away anytime soon and still is not going away even after spending $150 million on George Springer. This is like, Maybe I'm wrong here, and maybe I just have a skewed sense of things, and I think you can probably correct me better on this. But this, to me, in retrospect, really feels like peak Rogers doesn't support the team payroll right. time. Yeah, no, and absolutely. I th- and I think this, what did you say, was nine days before the Donaldson trade? Yeah, it, it Russell was the 18th, and and Donaldson was the 28th, so nine, 10 days because so those, of the timing. I think those 10 days were, you know, putting aside Russ and Donaldson's on-field contributions to the team. I think those 10 days were some of the biggest evidence of bucking that trend. And then also, uh, I think you could argue the beginning of the source of a ton of the vitriol in the last five, six years, of which I'm not going to sit here and say I wasn't part of. I'm also not going to sit here and say that it wasn't necessarily uh, unjustified. But you know, it went from uh, Rogers doesn't support the team, the payroll's too low, blah, 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 to holy shit, we got Russell Martin and Josh Donaldson in like 10 days. Yeah. And the entire vibe around the team changed even before they stepped on the field. Hey, everyone, we are starting our Sportsnet Central show with some breaking news. No rest for the Blue Jays. Kennedy Bonke here, by the way. It sounds like the Blue Jays and the Oakland A's 
have got a deal, a four-for-one deal, in fact. Yeah, four-for-one, and in the end, the Toronto Blue Jays are going to get a new third baseman out of this one. Josh Donaldson is coming to the Blue Jays. 28-year-old third baseman last year, Donaldson, he's a big-time hitter, hit 255, 29 home runs, and 98 RBIs. Going the other way in this deal may shock you a little bit. Brett Laurie is on his way to Oakland, along with pitchers Kendall Graveman and Sean Nolan and shortstop Franklin Barreto. So a four-for-one deal. The main components, Brett Laurie, he goes to Oakland. Josh Donaldson, he is coming to the Toronto Blue Jays. Yes, it was the 28th of Franklin Barreto, Kendall Graveman, Brett Laurie, and Sean Nolan to the Athletics just for Josh Donaldson. We talked about this last episode, and I think a little bit in the Laurie episode as well, but this sort of, you know, it's easy to look at this now and go, man, they got an MVP for Laurie, who was out of the league in four years, Kendall Graveman, who is, you know, still in the league and has turned into a reliever, uh, Franklin Barreto, who I don't think has ever caught a foothold anywhere, and Sean Nolan, who, if he's made an impact, uh, I certainly already forgot about it. But it's easy to forget that this was sort of shades of the DeMar DeRozan deal off the top, where it was like Laurie was selling a ton of jerseys. He himself had signified that, you know, the deals they had made previously for Reyes and Dickey, those were sort of justified. So you sort of had that DeMar DeRozan trade. And you also had a little bit, as much as it was like, hey, they're not afraid to make the big swings. There was still, and I think there is still to this day, we saw this with the Austin Martin thing. There's still some trepidation off of the Syndergaard thing where you're looking at like, oh man, are we really going to trade future shortstop Franklin Barreto? Are we really going to trade future <laughs> future ace Kendall Graven? Are we really going to trade, you know, our star in Brett Laurie? So it was like, you know, it's easy to say now, like what a ripoff, probably the best trade in Jay's history. But there was uh, plenty of people that were that balked at the prospect capital given up here. I also, I guess, kind of as a sequel maybe to uh, the last story time when we were talking about uh, the Cindergard trade. Uh, since we've been talking about it, a thing that I've sort of been wondering, and I, I'm not going to sit here and say, like, the Cindergard move ended up being the best move. Mm -hmm. But also, like, what more do you want for a, in a prospect trade right. than literally trading for the reigning Cy Young winner? Yeah. Like... I know Dickey has his detractors, and I think some of that is fair. I wonder a lot what Dickey's reputation would be had the 2015 team won. Like, if he would be looked at as such a pariah in a lot of senses. But, like, if a team traded... I, I don't know who, like, the top prospects are this year. Right. But Gav say... Gabby Moreno or something. P Pearson. But it's just, like, in baseball. Yeah, no, I got Wander Franco. So, yeah, I yeah. got you. Yeah. Say someone traded one, they traded Wander Franco for Robbie Ray. Right. No one would be like, well, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. I think it's such an odd move that Jays fans still have not recovered from. Yeah. And to your point, people were pissed that Brett Laurie got traded. Absolutely. Traded. Like, I remember like our little corner of like blog Jays Twitter was excited. But like the I would say almost the majority of people were pissed. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the part where I point out that Fernando Tatis Jr. was traded for James Shields once. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> but no, I, you're absolutely right. But um, James Shields also like was a huge contributing member of a bunch of teams. Yeah. By the time like, that trade was made, he was garbage. Like his ERA for the Chicago was 5.3 after that deal. I but yes, he went to Chicago. Yeah, your, your, your point is, is well made. And I think those are the scary stories. You, you remember the James Shields for Tatis and you remember Syndergaard for Dickey. But, you know, more often than not, they do turn out to be Barreto, Graveman, Laurie, and Nolan for Donaldson. That isn't the end of the dealing. They, they trade J.A. Happ for Michael Saunders. They sign Justin Smoke. They sign Adichio Carrera. All this happens within a month of the Martin deal. They select Chris Colabello off waivers. Some tiny major moves there in, in that winter of 2014, 2015, as they get ready to start a new season. Do you remember, and we're going to get in, we'll talk about the season and the deadline and all the moves. Talk about that next week. But I'll say before we, before we end this week's episode, as we, as we you know, lightly touch on the offseason team building, do you remember how you felt about the 2015 Blue Jays coming into the year? Oh, I was, I was so, I thought they were going to, you know, again, we'll get into this more next week, but 
at the beginning of the season, I thought they were everything that they eventually became. Right. If that makes sense. It was the team answering Jose and Casey Jansen's criticism. Right. Directly. And I, it was, it's also funny to look back at the beginning of the season, thinking about who we were excited for. Like I thought, uh, was it Miguel Castro? Uh, I thought, yeah. I yes, thought Miguel was Castro, Castro was going to be, was going to be uh, like the lights out closer for the next decade. Right. Yeah. I thought Castro was the guy and Osuna was going to be the like helpful bench. Like, yeah. 100%. Helpful reliever, but it ended up being Castro is that. I mean, I think right now you'd rather have Castro in, in 2021, but well, yeah, uh, yeah. He had that rather, nasty, a bag of, rather a bag of balls than <laughs> yeah, that nasty but, and you, and you forget, you know, Marcus Stroman had had, uh, Oh, the injury. 20, How for- he had 20 starts the year before with a 3.65. And it was like, Stroman's going to be the ace to lead this, staff because he had come up and looked so good and then he stepped on a sprinkler head in spring training i will say obviously this was you know it just contributes to the legend of 2015 and obviously it worked out okay in the end but stroman's injury day was like one of the lowest moments as a jays fan for me yes i got broken up with that morning that's right <laughs> that's right <laughs> and yeah, we did probably the worst sports field ever yep we sat at your kitchen table and I, it, we, we used the Yeti that has the unidirectional and we only turned one of the directions on. So like one of us could barely be heard. I was like mumbling into my chest. <laughs> 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 yeah, that was so right. It, it was such a, such an extreme high to an extreme low of, of feeling like they had the talent. And as you said, I think you said this last time that like the thing that the 2014 team was missing was like Brett Lowry being Brett Lowry of him being if he had been the guy to live up to the promise and not the guy that continued to get hurt and couldn't shake the tendencies that he had that ended up with him constantly being injured. If they could just fix that, then the the things they wanted to address would be addressed. And uh, you are right that certainly adding the 2015 American League MVP uh, addressed that. And more, and certainly gave them the attitude. Turned it, to, turned it into get it done league, which uh, lives on in infamy <laughs> from here on out. That was the part that I didn't expect. I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Can you believe Josh Donaldson's played for three teams since then? That's wild to me. That is truly, <laughs> that's crazy. Anyway, we are going to get into what the regular season was like. We'll talk about. Uh, obviously, we talked about Price and Tulo, but a little bit about about what it was like before that in this regular season and what it was like to watch this team day in and day out and and a little bit of how it was similar to 2021. We're going to talk about that next week on Sports World Storytime. Storytime.